The architecture respects the northwestern character of the surrounding residential neighborhoods, employing slope, asphalt shingle roofs, horizontal siding, frame glazing, and generous timber, timber details, <laughs> all in a, a complementary color palette. It also preserves components critical to successful commercial developments that include signage visibility, clear access points, pedestrian cover, and adequate exposure. This is a shot from uh, taken from the uh, Guthrie Road uh, access. Uh, this is building the, uh, the southeast corner. The single family homes are designed in a similar fashion, each one with a varied facade while preserving a cohesive character and shaped in more compact footprints intended to cater to younger <coughs> families and downsizing senior members in the community. The proposed development is fully accessible in many respects. Parking spaces and sidewalk letdowns, such as these, uh, are provided in strategic areas for differently abled individuals and raised crosswalks and has pedestrian safety by slowing on site vehicular traffic. Bicycle kiosks provided along the primary approach to each <coughs> road, as well as, bus, as well as a bus shelter on Guthrie, uh, support existing alternative transportation infrastructure and empower the community with a variety of transportation options. The, com the commercial buildings will be built to an equivalent LEED certificate standard, while built green platinum will be the sustainability standard for the single family homes. These metrics employ sustainable design strategies that may include passive solar design, uh, energy efficient and or energy exchange heating and cooling systems, recyclable and low VOC content materials, and sustainable construction management practices. The development proposal directly and readily responds to this community's broader sustainability and livability goals, beginning from the details of careful siting, appropriate design, accessibility, and many other sustainable design strategies, it aims to deliver the third E in the, uh, the three inseparable principles of sustainability, which is economics. Upon completion, this project will not only address the environment and equity mandates of sustainability, but will also, and perhaps more timely, provide the necessary venue for local businesses and entrepreneurs to generate employment and opportunity for members of the community. We respectfully request the uh, for the councils and the public support, and I look forward to working closely with the planning and engineering departments to see this project to, to completion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that concludes your presentation. I will ask council if you have questions at this time. Any questions? I just had a, a couple of questions, and, uh, and I you know, really appreciate your last information that you touched on and that you're high environmental standards. Um, uh, there was some comments on page 87 from our then Western Gulf on the um, sewer connection for the, the A um, building. The building A. About um, you know, whether it's services, <coughs> you, you will be. You, did you get the. Um, yes, we did. Yes, okay. we did. Thank so you're, you. You're yes. aware of that. You yes. think that can be overcome that. Uh, Concern. Absolutely. I think uh, moving forward, when we get our engineers on board, um, we will continue discussions with the planning and the engineering departments to make sure that all the services are, are uh, in place. If there are necessary upgrades, that we actually look into that uh, to make sure that uh, uh, whatever um, demands that the proposed development put, put, uh, place on the existing services are, are um, uh, addressed. And, <coughs> and I noticed that the First Nations also asked about um, archaeological assessments. I don't know if that's something that you uh, routinely do. Uh, they, they are a mm -hmm. copy of the report. Mm -hmm. Typically what happens is uh, when, a, when a project gets, gets off the ground and they start digging the hole, uh, sometimes, uh, or, or I, I should say in, in I shouldn't say in rare occasions, in some occasions, they might find some artifacts or, or pieces of, uh, of historical significance. And, uh, and when that happens, then, then the, uh, uh, these organizations start to, to, to come in and then there's, there's a dialogue that starts between the owners and, and, and these organizations <coughs> look after these, uh, these uh, components. So, um, 
we cannot say at this stage that that would be the case in this particular project. Um, but that, that cer there's certainly a process uh, uh, that, that, uh, that takes care of, of making sure that in, in, in case uh, uh, artifacts are in fact unearthed during construction, they are, they are uh, the, the necessary steps are taken to, to take care of them. That you are aware that they did ask for a, an archaeological assessment, so maybe you'll be dealing directly with someone. Yes, we would. We we would um, probably uh, discuss the, the details of that with the, the planning department, um, and then also with the owners with, with the owners of the, of the project. But certainly something that we we will consider. Okay, and uh, just a couple of things on the cycle route. Um, it was mentioned, I think it was in the Matthew Haney report, about whether to indent the bus uh, fill in lane or whether to have it at the bus actually stops in the bicycle lane. And, uh, mm -hmm. There was some inference that this is in turn an important cycling route, and that may be the case at the moment, but I, you know, the long term future that this will be, a, a, this, this will be one of the main routes. So I don't know if that's something that can be looked at. I would say that it, it's not a, a, an important bicycle route. Uh, it, it could, it, the, the approach to, to, to this particular issue would be similar to a traffic uh, study approach, whereby uh, traffic engineers would look at the, the current volumes, in this particular case of bicycle traffic and vehicular traffic and, and transit traffic, and, and determine at this point uh, what the appropriate uh, recommendation, what the appropriate solution might be. Uh, Similar to traffic reports, there's, uh, there's horizon years that they consider. And uh, again, depending on the volumes and, and the numbers that come out from the study, uh, that would then inform what the final recommendation. But that's certainly something that our engineers would look at. And then look at the longer picture. Because yes. Yeah. There's certainly all the languages in encouraging cycling, and your project is certainly aimed at doing that. And the, um, it does mention about the, uh, uh, the green markings on the road where you have the uh, traffic cycling um, crossover, um, similar to what the town has done in other areas. So I know that that's happening, and I assume that's part of the development and will be uh, put there by the development land and the, the town. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, it is. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just wondering, I didn't see it in this proposal, but I'm wondering perhaps if you have any uh, expertise on um, are there are we starting to put electric plug-ins for cars uh, and developments like this um, for future needs, and um, also any um, infrastructure suited for scooters, and by that I mean electric carts that Mobility Challenge people would utilize. Uh, my short answer there would be uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, only because uh, not to say that that, that that cannot be provided over time uh, or, or in, a, in, a, in a time in the future. But uh, at this at this particular time, there's no uh, I think there's no no clear consideration for that at this point. Again, um, like, like every component in the development, it all depends on what. The market is, is how the market is driving these requirements. Uh, if the demand is there, if the volume is there, um, I am very confident that the uh, planning staff and the engineering departments will begin to look into the details of this and how we might be able to provide this uh, when the time comes that, that the market actually uh, uh, demands for, for, for these infrastructure. But at this particular time, Anything further? Seeing none, your matter will be discussed. I understand you have to go, but I understand Jim will be staying. Yes, you wish. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, the next delegation will be the delegation from the Sid Williams Theatre Society, Tim Cretzman, the School of Leaders, and Deborah Renz. Welcome. Good evening, Comox residents, town staff, Comox counselors, and your worship, Mayor Ayas. My name is Tim Kretzman, and I'm a Comox resident and a member of the board of directors of the Sid Williams Theatre Society. 
It is a privilege for me to be here this evening to speak to you about a very important matter. I am joined this evening by our President, Nicole Peters, Vice President, Gail Limber, our Treasurer, Kathy Miller, and our General Manager, Deborah Rams. First of all, on behalf of the Sid Theatre Board and our 730 members, as well as the countless Comox Valley and Comox residents who use our facility, either as a member of the production or as a member of an audience, I would like to thank the Comox Council for its continued recognition of the importance that the theatre has in the life of the Comox Valley. Your contributions over the years are an example of your commitment to arts and culture in the Valley and a belief that there is value in funding these endeavors. The Sid Williams Theatre Society fundamentally believes our core principle of supporting local user groups is a key component of supporting the performing arts and cultural organizations in the community. We have been able to give preferential rates and booking opportunities to local organizations because of the contributions from entities such as the Town of Comox. Local user groups have been given this priority because of our firm belief that part of our mandate is to inspire and develop the arts and culture that is indigenous to the Comox Valley. As such, the Sid Williams Theatre Society is here this evening to request an increase in the town of Comox's funding of the society from the current support of $12,500 to a minimum of $20,000. We believe this to be a fair and reasonable request. Part of the reason that we are making this request is a result of an anticipated operational shortfall for the 2012 business year. This is not a responsibility on this society's part, but rather a product of a number of issues clearly outlined in our report to you to have with you. I would, however, like to highlight a significant factor, that being of our core facility operations. We have revamped our operations and this has cost the society a measure of income in the short term. And what we as a society were not prepared to do was sacrifice the well-being of our staff and eventually the quality of our services to the community and user groups to which we serve. Credit should be given to the society for its long-term vision instead of taking a short-term banding approach that was unconcerned for the big picture. The big picture, of course, being the long-term sustainability of our theater and the ability to continue to support local community groups. The support of arts and culture by local government is as important to the well-being of a community as funding recreation centers, playing fields, and other sporting endeavors. The social and economic benefits of the arts and cultural sector to our community as a whole are well documented in research. The Town of Comox's funding of the Sid Williams Theatre over the years is recognition of this fact. And we hope that with your increased allotment, the Sid can continue its mission of promoting arts and culture in the Comox Valley. We look forward to our continued relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, questions from members of council? Seeing none at this time, uh, I do thank you for your presentation. I know that this will come up in uh, budget discussions, which will ensue in February and March. <coughs> thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right, the next delegation is uh, Diane Lewis uh, regarding 574 Crestview Drive. I understand Diane is here to answer any questions regarding the uh, secondary suite application. So if you'd like to come forward, and uh, perhaps there might be questions, I'm not sure. If members of the council have any questions? The application is uh, page 31. Any questions for Ms. Lutz? Seeing none, I guess you're going to ask The matter will come up. Come up and then D. Fontaine. Secondary suite application for 1700 Beaufort Avenue. Any questions for Ms. Hunter? Seeing none, I guess uh, we can sit down. And then we have Ed Moyes and Barb Hansen here from the Blackfin Pub, and they're here to uh, present or answer questions as the case may be.
Do you have a presentation or knives? <laughs> I know you can't resist. Yeah. <laughs> Good work, and counselors. Um, I would like to say to all of you and the staff, I have never seen the road so clear out there in the snowfall of the first <laughs> field all year. So congratulations to all of you. It's been amazing. I have never seen so many grayers and trucks. So thank you very much. So we are open for business. <laughs> um, I wasn't planning on making any presentation. I was just going to open myself up for questions. Uh, I think I got all the information is there, and the staff, I think, have done an excellent job of preparing that. Any questions from members of council? Okay, I guess uh, your matter will come up for discussion shortly. You're off the hook. For now. For sure, it's the I think you might have dropped your glove up there, Ed. Behind the podium, you dropped your glove. Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. You can throw my gauntlet down. <laughs> All right, we have then the next delegation is from the Vancouver Island Mountain Sports Society. We have Rick Morrison and Gord County. Welcome, gentlemen. This just moves the presentation? I believe so. I think they just turned on the projector. Take a moment for a sort of a timely uh, time for us to be here because we represent the newest fitness facility in the Comox Valley and I understand that uh, Mayor Ives and his uh, fellow mayors are just entered a fitness challenge so an extended invitation to them and to Mayor Ives to, uh, to uh, work out in our facility. Society uh, was established back in 2003, and as you can see, our, our mandate was to provide financial support uh, for the development of individual athletes uh, and clubs involved in training and competition, um, support for transportation and, and lodging for those, those individuals, and also to assist in the acquisition of, uh, of uh, materials and educational resources for athletes to help with their training. Um, and the last that we added in 2005 was to operate and manage a mountain center. This all came about because of the Olympics that uh, happened in Vancouver a couple of years ago. Back when they were first announced, uh, community leaders were brought together and asked, uh, what can we do to help an athlete from uh, Vancouver Island get to the Olympics? And a lot of the clubs uh, that are involved in training athletes said, well, we, we look after the athlete's development, but what we do is, what we need is help in uh, getting athletes to competitions and to training. And uh, our society was formed because of that. Um, over the years, we've raised uh, close to $85,000 that's been distributed to athletes. And we had an opportunity in 2005 uh, to get involved in uh, some facilities development. And that was the, uh, the uh, changing of the trailhead in Strathcona Park to where it is now um, to allow for uh, complete disabled access and also to develop the, uh, the cross-country ski stadium, the, uh, the lights that are on the trails up near Raven Lodge, and, uh, and also the competition trails. That actually allowed the community to attract the 2007 and 2009 uh, IPC World Cup events that, that were here prior to the Olympics. Um, in 2000 and 2009, we had the opportunity to actually uh, work towards building a, a, a basically a sports center which become the Vancouver Island Mountain Center and that's the one that's in the middle there and uh, uh, we've been working on it for the last uh, year and a half 
and now it's, it's open for business. And I think the next slide shows a picture of it in the next couple. So that's a recent picture of the Vancouver Island Mountains Mountain Center. It's a facility itself is close to 10,000 square feet. It contains a full fitness facility, um, uh, outdoor uh, outdoor education accommodation uh, for 40 individuals or in it, a uh, kitchen, you can see everything that's here. The guy that was supposed to do the presentation uh, didn't make it because of the road, so this is the first time it's And uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the facility itself. Uh, but in terms of the Mount Washington community itself, uh, that community is made up of 500, just over 550 property owners. Of that, about 81 of them uh, reside here in the Comox Valley. Uh, the property owners contribute to the tax base of the local area to the amount of $1.8 million per annum. And of that, there's, a, there's an actual allocation from their taxes that go towards uh, the recreation facilities in the Comox Valley of about $48,000 a year. Uh, from what I can understand, there's, there's no funds that go from the Comox Valley into the Mount Washington community. Uh, from a local area government uh, uh, perspective. Uh, this is just a look at the facility. You can see the uh, fitness center, uh, some of the uh, accommodation rooms, and you can actually uh, book a massage there as well. <coughs> In terms of the, uh, the construction of the building, uh, the total, total cost of it was $3.3 million. Of that, there was a contribution from the federal government of 1.1 million. The provincial government, uh, directly and through some of its uh, uh, trusts that they've contributed to, like the uh, North Island Economic Trust, uh, contributed close to $900,000. We, as a society, uh, raised uh, both uh, from private and uh, and uh, corporations $750,000 towards the center, which actually includes the fitness facility that was donated by Good Life Fitness. Uh, and we have a bank loan with the uh, Coastal Community Credit Union of $550,000 uh, towards the building. We essentially, the building's open, everybody's been paid, and, and we're operating. We're at a point here where we're looking to local area government to help us with the operations of the facility. And uh, uh, I guess the, the point we make is that the Mount Washington community is part of the Comox Valley. It's an important part of our, uh, of our economy. Uh, of of the, uh, the users of the, of the area, uh, there's 400,000 user visits there a year. Uh, 100,000 of those come from the Comox Island. Uh, the employment base at Mount Washington is just over 800 people. And of that, over half of, it, half of those people live in the Comox Valley. And the total payroll of people that live in the Comox Valley as well over four four million dollars a year. So we're an important part of the community. Um, and the Mount Washington community itself has contributed to the tax base and recreation facilities within, within this area for well over the last 30 years. And they haven't received anything back from the community. And we're here asking for some support from the community. I'll turn it over to Bert Kemp. Okay, so although Bank of Mountain Center is um, asking for $50,000 annually, it's not that we're um, really coming, only cup in hand with no other uh, components. And just to give you an idea of some of that, uh, the Bank of Brown Mountain Sports Society has funded 84 emerging athletes, as Rick said, since uh, 2005, but 50 of these athletes have come from the Comox Valley each. And that was sponsored at five hundred dollars a piece. That's twenty-five thousand dollars for local athletes has been sponsored since two thousand five. Uh, we helped put the stadium and lights and the legacy trails for the cross country area up top. Uh, we set the stage for the BC Parks uh, staging area at the trailhead there. And even though these societies built a three point two million dollar facility uh, without any tax rule help. Um, we're still $200,000 short, and 10 of the directors and local community members 
have uh, personally guaranteed two hundred thousand dollars of their own uh, to ensure the final construction costs are covered. Luke Gundy, uh, Rick, Mor that's Rick Morrison, the big one who made that happen. The Mount Washington uh, Resort, cooperation with the clubs and make up uh, the Mountain Sports Society, have uh, sponsored over 10,000 grade 5 students to come up and learn ski since 2001. Over 80% of these uh, have been from schools from the Comox Valley. Vancouver Mountain Centre is uh, offering, uh, as a show of support to local coaches and athletes, free fitness uh, access and use of uh, meeting facilities up there. Even though we're dire need of uh, cash, we think that's a really important component to uh, offer our local athletes. We just, uh, we just finished this uh, <coughs> fitness center and we uh, anticipate the main clients are going to be the mountain owners, renters, employees, as well as school and next Valley uh, residents will be up to the day to supplement their uh, fitness or skiing things by using our fitness facility. Our center, even though it's just open, is booked uh, almost solidly now for the weekends. But uh, as most places, trying to get the midweek is going to be very difficult. And um, our center, which is being run by the Tribune Bay Outdoor Education Center, um, which uh, works out of Hornby Island, we have 3,000 annual uh, students come, with 60% of those coming from the Comox Valley. We anticipate we could be making the same sort of relationships we do with local uh, recreation centers. We'll be doing uh, partnerships with uh, Courtney Recreation Association, Cumberland Institute, and also with the Comox uh, Rec Center to do programming up there during the midweek. Um, just like the pools and arenas, we're not going to be doing it at cost recovery because it's, we want to make it affordable for others. And just in closing, I guess I want to say um, this, this weekend uh, there's consultants that are up there meeting with the stakeholders of the mountain on the uh, Region District, Mount Washington uh, Community Plan. And after being a resident up there for 24 years, I can tell you the main topic what people want to know is they're spending $48,000 a year off the tax roll on recreation, and they just want to know what they have to get in for that. And right now, I think if uh, the Region District and the towns uh, down here were to show, show some support, I think it would go a long way to appease uh, some of their concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the delegates? Uh, I just had a quick question and, and great for Sally's building and, and credit to the Valley and the credit to all the work that you guys have done to, to make it happen. And you mentioned that the um, uh, Tribune Bay uh, Outdoor Education Society was running it. And, and you mentioned that um, uh, they will use their expertise in fundraising. Do you, do you see that, are you seeing that there is any opportunities? Um, Most definitely, I've, I've seen it already. Mm -hmm. um, one at right, um, uh, just before Christmas, the, uh, through their help, so we were able to secure a, a DC lottery grant of um, $175,000, which was absolutely necessary to uh, allow the building to open. Um, uh, they have, uh, they, they they worked uh, almost 24/7 uh, to get the building open and uh, the scene. So that's that's a little bit of their success. Do, do they see any opportunities with the actual ongoing running costs, or were they mainly really putting capital? Oh, um, ab absolutely. There's there's lots of opportunities. There's there's grants. We've actually applied. We've got six in the uh, can right now as far as applying for different grants with the uh, New Horizons or with the. Uh, federal government with accessibility uh, grants and things. So there's, there's some others that we've applied for. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of other organizations doing the same thing, but uh, that's going to be part of our expertise is offering that, uh, that component too. One, one other little piece that we did is we worked with the uh, credit union here in town. We didn't have the, the cupboards in the kitchen and uh, we did a team building with the local credit union. They came up and uh, put the cabins together, and they brought five thousand dollars to give us the kitchen cabins in the, in the kitchen there. So we're working real hard to make that happen. Any other questions? Seeing none. Uh, thank you for your presentation. All right, so we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting of council for approval. Uh, the December seventh council meeting minutes. Moved. Approval then. All those in favor? Motion is carried. 
And also the special meeting of council is a public hearing held December 7th. Move. Second. 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 All those in favor? Motion's carried. And then per receipt, the committee of the whole meeting, minutes of December 14th. Per receipt. On receipt, then all those in favor? Motion's carried. And there were two recommendations coming out of that. Firstly, that um, the Comox Archives and Museum request that the continuation of monthly grant payments at $2,083 per month be continued until the uh, cultural services budget for 2012 through 2016 is adopted as part of the next financial plan by law. So move for that. That's that. Second. Any discussion on that? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. And secondly, that council support the application to the BC Community Rec Grant Program for the Anthony Park Recreation and Revitalization Project. Second. Second. And second. Any further discussion? All in favor? And then for the January 11th, the committee of the whole, we have minutes for receipts. Second. I receive them. All those in favor? Motion is carried. And there are recommendations coming out of that meeting on the pedestrian crossing concerns at Robin Anderson. That council included 50000 as a pedestrian crossing project at the Rob Anderson intersection as outlined in the transportation study for consideration in 2012 for the upcoming 2012-2016 financial plan. And further, that council requests the school district complete a safe routes to school plan for Rob Road and Cape Lazo slash Brooklyn schools and implement and maintain a crossing program to support the crossing of uh, school children both before and after school. And also that the school board chair and the Comox trustee be invited to a future committee hall meeting in order to share information and discuss issues of common concern. Move for all that. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion is carried. And then we have recommendations regarding carry for it and suspended capital budgets to 2012. That staff be authorized to continue to spend the following amounts authorized in the 2011 financial plan on the following items of projects that have been listed there. And the CAO understand that the urban forestry plan amount has been changed. Yes, you wish to make to reduce that from 25000 to 14000 okay. So all the other ones are listed as further recommendation. Any further dis... Or we need a move for that, sorry. I'm saying with the amendment. Yes, with the amendment. And any further discussion? All those in favor? And then uh, regarding the CDRD Air Quality Monitoring Program, uh, the recommendation from the Committee of the Whole was that Town of Comox agrees to partner with the regional district in the operating costs of the air quality monitoring station. The maintenance program from Comox Valley and further the annual operating contribution from the town be equal to the population based proportional share of an annual operating budget at maximum of 7000 Annual recommendation? Second. Second. Discussion? I just was noting in the paper that there was some uh, reference to that uh, station. And it wasn't just reading two, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone all the way up to 3.9. <laughs> but you know, you could ask any grade 11 student who's taken a, a, a geography course, you know, when you get a cold air pressure and you get an open burning season out in the regional district and, and exhausted, you're going to get more particulates in the air. And, I think this is a waste of money. I still not going to support it. Fair enough. I just want to make sure you saw it. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in uh, terms of the vote, then, all those in favor? Just, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, do we need to include in this that we'll look to gas tax money, yeah. the possibility of gas tax money for our chair as the regional district does? We've that taken that as staff for a Okay, great. Reflect that hopefully in the budget if it's possible. Thank you for that reminder. And so we are. This uh, we're a little more confident today that this actual monitoring isn't just showing two across yes. the board. We're not in fact, I for somebody to write two on a page. No, I looked at the website across the province in the last few days. There's been readings all the way up to four. So, I mean, it, two is sort of a baseline, and it goes up beyond that. I, I would imagine the summer at the Lower Mainland it gets up higher than four, and it provides archival information as well. It is a province-wide program, essentially. Mm -hmm. All right, all those in favor. Those opposed? One opposed? And motion carries. And then regarding the Arts Community Center proposal at 2182 Comox Avenue, 
Uh, firstly, that staff be directed to accept on a fast track basis zoning amendment application for res a residential and restaurant use at 2182 Sunrise Avenue. And secondly, that staff be directed to prepare a tax exemption program by law for consideration. Item 7 move. Is there a second for that? Second. Okay. And I just had a question for staff. Um, you know, we referenced the restaurant use. Do you have to add, say anything about ancillary or is it uh, understood that that's an ancillary use? Um, if uh, council would wish it to be uh, limited to ancillary, the intent was to allow it as an outright use, um, and thereby, um, and thereby uh, provide you know maximum sort of flexibility. But at the same time, uh, now that I think about it, it would be easily to it would be easy to tie it to an assembly use, such that um, it's not ex it's not subordinate to it, but it can only be done in conjunction with an assembly use. So I guess the question, I don't know what council thinks about it, but is there a wording change that we need to consider that? Um, I would just take guidance from council if you okay. wish to be... Um, I'll let council provide that or if there's any further comments. Well, I just had a couple other questions. Number one, could you just update us on uh, how, if, if we were to fast track this, how long it would delay other people in the queue? I know that you had a better look at this, Marvin, and thought maybe your original was not quite correct, so... Um, yes, we're um, anticipating, um, given that it's already been before council and council um, is well advised of it, um, in terms of the zoning aspect of it, it would be about a week. Um, there would be some additional work to do in terms of the revitalization by law itself, which we've never done, our, which we've never done so it's hard to estimate that. Okay. And when we're looking at uh, tax exemption program, would that be similar to uh, let's say somebody came to do a development in our downtown and we were considering a tax holiday while they were building. Would that be considered in this same? Is that something we would be considering at the same time? The CEO, I know this had some thoughts on that. The, uh, the focus for the application at 2182 Comox is more based on the heritage program that uh, the city of Nanaimo has developed, and that's something that we're looking at. That's a copy of. But we are taking into account <clears throat> the notion of making a broader program for providing tax holidays and those implications. So we're looking at both at the same time. So, okay, so. Um, they may have come forward. One may come forward before the other. Okay. But so we're looking, doing our homework for both. So is that something we should maybe put on our management plan as a reminder? I'm thinking more, to, I mean, you are saying what you're going to do sooner, I would think, or maybe at the same time. Mm -hmm. Just something, because I know it's a big issue out there, especially for a lot of the downtown business people, to see what we're doing at our council table to push that forward. And uh, just, you know, it seems to me it might be something that would fit nicely on the management plan to keep us apprised of its progress. Yeah, at this point, we're, of course, I know we haven't got there. we're dealing with 2182 yeah. from Watson, and, and perhaps, I think, Staff have got that in mind. We may need to deal with a specific uh, required recommendation. Well, I'm jumping the gun by one thing to the order, but they're kind of related in their own way. So. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I, I don't think we've got enough information, perhaps, back from staff yet as to what that would entail. But I'm certainly, certainly looking at, first and foremost, the heritage aspect for this party, and then a broader implication of the BIA will be working on uh, its strategic plan process, and I'm sure that'll come out of it as well. Okay. All right, any further questions? Yes? I just, I, um, for <coughs> what I would like uh, information on is what we see as the downside for the town should this proposal get partly along. Um, and I don't know who best would answer that or have some ideas on it. Yeah, it'll probably come out of the report or discussion on the tax exemption program once the details of that uh, other communities have gone through it. Uh, and I believe that it probably have some uh, parameters where you, know, you don't get your money unless you've done the work, essentially. Uh, it's not a sort of an advanced payment, if you will. That's the way I understand they mostly work on a reimbursement basis or a qualification basis. But I suspect that when we get this back to us uh, on the second aspect of this motion, then we'll probably get that kind of information. I think we heard that as well last time we discussed it. So I would imagine other communities have gone through those considerations. Okay, any further? 
Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is favor. All right, uh, moving to the management report then, uh, page 29. For receipts, please move receipts. Second. Receipt then, all those in favor? Motion is carried. And I don't believe there's anything to update on that. Other than what's shown there, so I'll be able to hear more about those items in the future. Moving along then to the rezoning application, RZ 1114 for 574 Crestview Drive as a secondary suite. The third reading, bylaw 1699 is before us. Is third reading? Here. Second. Any discussion at third reading? All those in favor? Motion carried. Move adoption. Thank you. Second. Adoption. All those in favor? Motion is carried. And then we have following public hearing regarding 375 Butchers Road. Is rezoning application RZ 10-09 bylaw 1698 for the reading. I'll move that. Sir. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Under special reports at page 47, we have the uh, regional board for meeting minutes of December 13th in Ogle League for receipt. Move receipt. Second. Second. Seconded. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, moving on for bylaws, we have the financial plan bylaw amendment 2011, bylaw 1700 for adoption. Adoption. Second. Second on adoption, then. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Moving along in our new business, we have the rezoning application RZ 11 15 for the secondary suite 11 at 1700 Boltwood Avenue. The first and second reading bylaws 1702. I'll move that. Second. Any discussion on that? No, all those in favor? Motion is carried. In accordance with section 890, a motion is required to waive the requirement for a public hearing. Mm -hmm. so, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, we now have the development variance permit application, DVP 11 5, and zoning bylaw amendment as well, RZ 12 02. Both of you with Blackman Pub at 132 <coughs> Street. Can I ask a question? Sir, mm -hmm. If we go to this file of 1707, does that still re mean that we need a development variance permit? That, uh, Sorry, you're talking, oh, okay, the bylaws that uh, have been up for this today? <coughs> yeah. Um, I, I would ask staff to respond. Those bylaws are here for reference point purposes at this point. No. Um, so they would grant uh, they would grant um, the variance automatically. Yes, um, they'd, they'd be more than covered under this proposal. Yes. Okay. You know because you know we all we're all interested in downtown revitalization. Revitalization. I'm sorry. We're all interested in seeing our downtown succeed. More people coming down there and looking over this bylaw 1707. Or, sorry, uh, bylaw 1377, amended bylaw. This is going to help to move this forward. I think we all campaigned on this. We all like to see it. So rather than uh, uh, spending a whole bunch of time or more delay by sending this out for referral, I'd like to move first and second reading of this bylaw and then encourage Councillor Grant to who sits on both the CVETs and the uh, BIA to encourage those people, you know, those two organizations to make submissions either prior to or at the public hearing that will be held in this matter. So I'd second that. Okay, so let's make sure we got the motion there. That bylaw 1707 will be given first with the second reading? Yes. The so bylaw 1707 is what's been uh, left at your place and given an opportunity to read that. Yes. Um, one, of the, one of the rationales for this too is that our Economic Development Society meets quarterly and we've only just met mm -hmm. and our BIA meets every two months so we could effectively be delaying this for a couple of months mm -hmm. when they could easily come to the public hearing and make a submission. Um, and these are uh, this topic certainly at the BIA has been, um, you know, a topic of regenerating and getting more more uh, 
business activity in our downtown core. So, uh, you know, I'm not uh, thinking that we're going to have any problem with either one of those, but I will certainly take them as you ask and, and get comment uh, and encourage them to either write a submission or show up to the public hearing and do that. And if think we can help move this along a little bit faster, I think it'd be great. All right. Councillor Fletcher. And then just to confirm, many of the businesses in the area will receive notification Anyways, of the, of the public hearing and this being done, so it's kind of redundant in some ways to give up. Sure, and there's certainly nothing wrong with us uh, sending a letter to the VIA Embassy that's um, executive to let them know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's so like uh, Councillor Grant will be there, but I think a formal letter, not necessarily a referral, but a formal letter just saying here's what we're doing and that a, a date for a public hearing will be set in the future. All right, so um, that's been moved and second. Any further discussion on first and second reading? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. And uh, I just take it to mean that we don't need to have that, obviously, that referral motion that was printed there, and that's uh, kind of by the wayside this thing. Okay. So, so can I ask one question then before we move on? Is uh, we would be now uh, looking for a public hearing. How long is that going to be? Are we um, we would take a look at the council's availability. We try to schedule it as soon as possible. So um, we do have to advertise and take the second issues of the paper. Um, so we, we would get on that as soon as possible. So it's around a month. Uh, yes, three weeks to a month. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. And Councilor Fletcher. Seeing nothing further on that, I take it we dealt what we have to do on that, or is there anything further? Your Worship, could I also ask then that the somewhat companion bylaw to establish the capital reserve fund, bylaw 1708, also be I move first and second reading of bylaw 1708. Second. Okay, and if you could just uh, give us a synopsis of what that does. The, in bylaw 1707, part of the amendments would allow uh, a business that uh, can't provide, uh, in, in terms of, can't, doesn't provide the uh, parking, provide bike parking, if they can't provide adequate bike parking, they can choose to make a payment mm -hmm. to this capital reserve fund, which then, uh, as, as the wording says, it would be used for alternative transportation funds, so the cost for transportation infrastructure that supports walking, bicycling, bicycling public transit, or other alternative forms of transportation. That's two thousand dollars per space not provided. That's right. Okay. Thank you for that. So that's been moved and seconded for bylaw seventeen oh eight. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Great. All right. I'll just let you thank you. See you all for putting this forward in rather time. <laughs> no, it's Three, it's half an hour or something. Well, <laughs> yeah. no, thanks to staff, and we'll move that. Ahead quickly, I think that's a great initiative. Yeah. Okay, so um, we now have our planner going to provide a presentation on 2310 Guthrie Road, which we first heard from the developer earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
the land use designation of uh, mixed use commercial residential is really in response to some of the larger issues affecting this site. Uh, first being high traffic. Uh, Guthrie, we have the high vehicle traffic. Um, it's uh, dedicated arterial road. It's a truck route in ROCP as well. Um, it's currently two lanes. It uh, is designed to go to four lanes in the future. We have existing traffic light um, already at the intersection of Guthrie and McDonald. Um, and Guthrie is a bus route. McDonald is also a major collector designation in our OCP. It is a gateway property. McDonald is the boundary between um, Courtney and Comox, so it's the uh, first development um, that people would see entering on Guthrie Road when they're entering Comox. Bike lanes, um, either existing or proposed, are uh, on Guthrie and McDonald Road. It's the highest level of, in terms of bike transportation in our network. We have existing multifamily to the south and southeast. Such a site right here, we're looking at to the south right here is 2300 million that. Um, southeast, we have the townhouse development along Guthrie South. Um, we have park and wetlands to the southwest, so right here on the corner. And a uh, single family secondary suite um, to the east, we have the back of place area. Immediately to the north, this frontage right here, is Regional District. Um, that is, however, with the Southern Expansion Area, so that has been facilitated in the RGS and in our OCP uh, for urban expansion. In terms of sustainability, the uh, new OCP is built around um, sustainability. Um, this project uh, has a well, it checks off all the boxes and does so quite well in terms of the uh, land use. It's providing neighborhood orientated uh, retail and commercial. In terms of uh, transportation, multimodal, so bus, pedestrian, bike, and vehicle. Uh, greenhouse gas reduction, we have the lead equivalency on the commercial component and the built green BC platinum proposed for the uh, residential component. In terms of the neighborhood context, um, fitting in with the neighborhood context, we have the land use um, difference being done in terms of having the commercial on the southern portion of the site and solely uh, single family residential along traffic place. Commercial is limited to single story. Um, West Coast design in the commercial. Um, we also have a variety of the single family um, dwelling uh, design elevations. And we'll, uh, in terms of breaking it up between one and two store buildings as well. Uh, it provides an alternative housing form um, with a uh, single family on approximately uh, 300 square meter sites. So it would be simple lots. There's affordable housing contribution that's been uh, proposed, provision of adaptable housing in accordance with uh, town policy. So one of the single family units would meet our adaptable housing provisions of the zoning bylaw. And it's also reflective of, um, of positive financial implications for the town, this typical infill development. In terms of the regional growth strategy, um, the technical advisory team that and review uh, the implications. Uh, the key point that they did make was the consultant that drafted the RDS when they were identifying um, shifting from vehicle to multimodal, and it, the key point was the provision of pedestrian transit and light infrastructure. So they really saw this as a, as a development that met that goal and would help in terms of uh, allowing multimodal transportation. Provision of expanded housing choice they noted, so the compact development and sustainable construction, all in accordance with the uh, regional growth strategy principles. Um, and again, the settlement expansion area to the north, so it was not good that it's um, saved for urban expansion. In terms of our climate action charter goal, um, it does aid, uh, move us towards uh, creating complete more energy efficient communities. Development permit areas. So it's in development permit area number four. It's a form of character development permit area. Key, two primary key issues are compatibility with surrounding developments and orientation to the bike streets. In terms of compatibility with surrounding developments, um, it's really seen in terms of site access. So you have no access to the commercial development um, from Tudor Place. Sure. You have a sort of traffic. And you have all um, commercial parking separate from the Red residential. So you only have two access points to, to the commercial development being on Guthrie and on McDonald's. So. <coughs> Is there pedestrian access from traffic? 
yes, there is a pedestrian mm -hmm. access being proposed coming in through there. So you still have a shortcut. I just, can I make a comment while this is up? Sure. I think this is brilliant that we've got these, uh, this residential because to be honest with you, when I heard that there was a, a proposal coming on this, I thought, oh boy, are we going to hear from these people on Tracker Place? You know, because I'm sure they bought their single family homes in their nice quiet neighborhood, and they're going to be staring at a big commercial building here. And when I saw this, I thought, wow, well, you know, because all these people who are going to buy any one of these six houses are going to be fully aware and apprised of what's going on behind them, and so they have no recourse. But, you know, those people are now. Uh, Protected, I guess, or satisfied. I would hope. I would hope. I, mean, I, I think I mean, that's really reflective of the proponent. Uh, the proponent um, went forward, talked to the neighborhood, uh, received their concerns. Um, in response to their concerns, um, this was originally supposed to be two stories, it was chopped right down to one story. Um, so it really embraced the concerns by the neighborhood and did um, a very extensive redesign. Well, I think it's growing the interface between the existing and the new. Yeah, it was it was very nice to work with a uh, proponent that embraced uh, the sustainability and the neighborhood issues um, to such a high degree. Uh, the commercial is mentioned, limited to one story, the West Coast design, and even residential features in terms of the exterior materials, like the hardy board, so you have a siding, uh, you have asphalt shingles. Being proposed. The orientation to the street takes on more prominence in this um, site just because of, of its location. So already in order, we have the gateway, lo uh, gateway location. And also in terms of this multimodal and, and connecting to our transit network, we just have high traffic areas for pedestrians with a sidewalk, full sidewalk along um, Guthrie. We have the bus route um, with a bus stop being proposed here. Um, we also then have, um, in terms of the vehicles and being able to um, being also able to have ready access to vehicle traffic and that um, commercial accessibility to the vehicle. So it's not exactly, it's not turning its back on the vehicle, it's really balancing that. Um, so the street orientation um, really focused on the building location. So in terms of having that edge, um, also in terms of the building design, extensive glazing along the streets um, and the um, unit entrances along the street. And the screening of the parking. So they have that screening where it does come into this area. Also, by having these areas, what they were able to do was have that street orientation and still have parking within ready access. So people who do have mobility problems or anything else like that do have ready access to the primary entrance. Of the All right. Thank you very much. Any questions for our partner this morning? <coughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, we do have a recommendation here that we refer for comment to the advisory plan. I'll move that recommendation. Yes, Any further discussion on that recommendation? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. All right, so we'll move forward to there. And I do want to uh, particularly note the financial implication report that our director of finance did, shown on page 80. Very, very well done. Okay, so moving on to page 125, we have a report from our CAO and it's regarding secondary suite and bylaw issues at uh, 1787 and 1793 Mole Avenue. First motion is that the uh, report be received. Second. Can we see that? All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, CAO, do you have anything further to add other than the report? No, we don't. I think we all recognize that, you know, both globally and locally, you know, there's some economic difficulties going on, and, and uh, I think that we should allow, you know, the, the property owners here a little bit of leeway until such time as the economy improves, because, number one, we're going to throw people out on the streets who are probably very good tenants. And I understand that they're actually in violation of what that zoning allows, but the guy originally tried to sell those houses to, you know, keep in with the bylaws, so it would be somebody living in a house and renting out a suite. Well, it wasn't his fault. The market turned around in 2008 and things were going wrong, so 
I, I just think that uh, we should show a little bit of heart here and see what can be done if we allow it to exist in this manner for another little while. I don't know how long that be, because I don't know how long it's going to take the economy. Yeah, Councillor Cameron, and then Councillor. Well, I, I guess when I read this, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with this because. To me, the focus here is to make sure that when you rent a house with a suite in it, that you've got good tenants and the house is kept up and the tenants aren't throwing parties and, and having big problems. And part of the rationale for that is to have an, an owner-occupier. Well, you can have a guy have a dump of a house that lives there. I, I don't think that that particular piece actually solves the problem that, we're, that we've got here. It won't be the people in the main house here that get kicked out. It will be the people in the suite that are probably the ones that have the least ability to pay rent. So I would concur that a little bit of uh, leniency here. Uh, I've driven by this house and seen it, and it seems to be in really good shape. I don't see any problems with tenants or, or anything like that going on. And so uh, I, I would concur with you. I, I don't think that our rationale that just because you live in the house, it's somehow going to make it better is really what the focus should be. It should be how the house is fitting in with the neighborhood. So, I, you know, I know the attempt is there, but I don't know that it fits in every case. And I think this is one where, uh, you know, we're going to be putting people into financial hardship and we're going to be throwing people out on the street that may well not be able to afford to find another place to live. So uh, I would concur. I think some leniency here would be, would be a nice thing to do. Okay, Councilor Fletcher, next. Um, thank you. Um, you know, the owner occupancy piece of these secondary suites is what's given me a lot of comfort, and I think it's given some of the community some comfort in recognizing that an owner would be in that house, and so they would ensure that there wouldn't, ideally, they would ensure that there wouldn't be excessive noise parties, et cetera, it would be well maintained. And then, you know, we just saw in Courtney this week, they had a secondary suite public hearing that, you know, there was a lot of concerns. I, I don't know if they have that owner occupancy piece to it. No, they, they don't. And, and so I think it's given the Comox community a lot of comfort. Um, we're seeing that secondary suites are going through quite easily. So I don't want to dismiss this piece because I think it's a very important part of the bylaw. And, and no, I know we're not dismissing it, but so some leniency, yes, but I think it may need to be tied to the fact that this. This needs to move along. So maybe give the uh, the owners some time, but the market may not turn around. We don't we don't know that. So I don't. Well, we know it's going to turn around. <laughs> 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 I, <swear. laughs> I appreciate the optimism, but I, I just maybe staff can provide some insight. Just uh, and draw your attention to the fact that this complaint has been outstanding since March of uh, last this past year. So it's uh, a couple months it'll be a full year, and so you know in terms of leniency, um, you know I suppose we could. Um, I mean, really, the only options here for the owner are a sell the property, or b move back in. It doesn't look like they're going to move back in. They're not living in no. the Valley. So really, what we're talking about here is sell the property. I think that if we went ahead with a bylaw amendment, uh, which is what they've requested. The renewable or occupancy, I, well, I can't speak for everyone, but I, I did note one of the letters that was received this evening on one of the secondary suite applications supported it, well, but only on the condition that it be owner occupied. Certainly in our OCP process, that was identified. So, in terms of leniency, I'm not sure how much time, more time we want to give for them to sort this out. Uh, it is an unfortunate situation for sure for these particular owners. And I guess <coughs> the only option is really here to sell. Back in. Thank you, and I, I also share the concern about removing that requirement that uh, it be owner occupied, and uh, the fact that we are moving ahead with uh, quite a few secondary suites and waiving public hearing, and there seems to be a high comfort level, and I think it is largely as you and uh, Councillor Fletcher have said because of that provision that we have in the bylaw. Um, is, was this um, a neighborhood generated concern? How did it come to you? Yes. yes. So there is concern in the neighborhood that this is, this is unruly. 
Yes, I mean, it would be nice if there is some leniency in it. I, I certainly share the concerns that uh, we don't want to be evicting people who have established themselves in a, in a home. Um, so it is a dilemma. I don't know if we can delay it longer, if we know the plans of the owner. Is it what's on the market, is it? I believe it, it's still on the market. And if the property is sold, um, the tenant's rights are preserved so long as the buyer doesn't want to move into the suite. So presumably one of the attributes of selling is perhaps we need to sell with the suite with the tenant, assuming there's tenants. Although obviously one part of the house would have to be vacated. Well, one go ahead, Tom. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. Well, I just want to point out that I was not in favor of amending the bylaw to make it, you know, that wasn't my intention. I think that the, that's written in there and that does give the neighborhood a certain amount of comfort. I'm just looking to preserve the bylaw the way it is, but, you know, uh, let this go on for a little while longer until uh, until uh, Ms. Piccolo can, can solve this problem. I mean. They didn't create their, their health problems on purpose, and they didn't create the market situation. So I, I think as uh, compassionate people, we can see what we can do and uh, give them a bit of time. Well, that would be, uh, if there is a motion comes forward in a moment, we have to set a time. So I have Councillor Akan and then Matthew. Yeah, no, that was going to be my, Tom pretty much said what I was going to say, which is, you know, life changes sometimes, and in a perfect world it works out nicely the way the bylaws are written, but it's not always a perfect world for everybody, and, you know, sometimes we could show a little bit of uh, restraint here. Uh, you know, when you ask for a time frame now, though, you're asking to guess when the market might pick up so the guy could actually get his money back out of this well, situation, and that's, that's a tough call. That's right? very subjective. And that's, that's my point, yeah, and how do you know? I don't think staff can operate on that basis. So we need a specific date. Uh, that touches on my point: is that uh, what's what's the definition of, uh, of leniency? How long a time? And it, would it become a precedent? If we do it here, then uh, uh, you know what do we do? And, uh, leniency perhaps should be discussed, but is is a year and a half leniency? Is two years leniency? Is six months leniency? Yeah. What would happen if uh, the motion to continue with bylaw enforcement action? That was passed. What would the next steps be? Uh, <clears throat> we would we would communicate that message back to the owners, and essentially we would negotiate what would be a reasonable time for them to do it, bring the units into compliance. And, and compliance could be in a number of ways, whether it's uh, removing the illegal use of the suite, selling the properties, uh, any number of those factors. So that would. Be essentially create several months worth of discussion about it. Uh, rather than us sitting here trying to determine what is fair and, and reasonable, I'd like to see staff go back to the owners of the property, Mr. Pickwell and, and Mr. Sorensen, and see what sort of rapport we can gain with them, what sort of negotiations we can come up with, what he thinks is a reasonable time, what you think is a reasonable time, and then come back to us with a report so we can make a decision on that. I mean, bylaw enforcement generally rests with staff uh, in terms of dealing with it. Uh, you know, the back and forth could happen at a staff level. Um, you know, I think the CEO wanted to bring this forward because there was a letter of request regarding the revision of the bylaw. That clearly is not going to happen. We would so advise the owner and, you know, essentially, other than receiving this report, staff would carry on with bylaw enforcement on the usual terms. We've had some of these issues go on for several months, and from time to time they tend to resolve themselves. I don't think we've gone to court on very many. Okay, well, we're not going to, we're not going to, I don't think I've heard a motion to amend the bylaw. No, so no. we've received the report, so. And the staff will carry on with yeah. it. So okay, yeah. that's satisfactory. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll leave it at that. The staff will carry on, and if necessary, they'll let us know if there's other things that we require from us. Good discussion. Okay, so moving on to the Bank Around Mountain Society request for funding. We have a letter from the Regional District. They're looking for a member of municipalities to respond to the Regional District by February 3rd. There was a report outlining uh, three different options that uh, were being considered at the Regional District. Of course, we have heard a presentation here this evening from representatives from the Mountain Sports Society. Staff have reviewed and have provided a brief report um, addressing essentially two of the options. Um, 
being either to uh, have the monies redirected that Mount Washington currently pays into uh, recreation back to Mount Washington, or secondly, increasing the, the overall regional recreation grant amount by $45,000, both of which would uh, cost us the town here in the range of seven to $10,000. Um, and then the other option that uh, it's not really having comment on, it's not really one to comment on, is if they establish a new service specific to the Missouri, which uh, would take longer and wouldn't have any direct impact on us necessarily. So, um, Council's pleasure on that. Then we'll go back to the regional district. I noticed that uh, the city of Courtney dealt with this on. Monday, and they have essentially referred it back to the CDRD around the Regional Recreation and Cultural Report, which has been done and sitting there for further directions. We can go back to the Regional District on that basis as well. And what, what would the effect of that be? Well, that was to determine whether, in fact, the Mount Sports Society would come under the category of that report, and if so, that it would become eligible for funding and consideration, at least, under the Regional Recreation Plan. There's two regional uh, recreation funds at the regional district, one for the sports and aquatic centers, which this is a couple of and then one just for general recreation, and that covers a whole host of items from the outdoor pool to special needs to skateboard park maintenance and uh, permanent field maintenance, etc. Sort of a grab bag of uh, items that over the years has uh, built up to a certain amount, and I know that was uh, had a separate report as well. And would uh, I don't expect you to know this, but um, what kind of budget would that fund have? Like, could they handle a fifty thousand dollar? It doesn't. No, I mean, it, it, if it was increased by forty five thousand, currently would be five thousand of that. The effect on us is shown. I think at table three. Okay, so that's what table three yeah. falls into. But you know, the, the requisition you'll see there for the whole valley is two hundred thirty five thousand for 20, 2011. Okay. and then obviously increase that up to two eighty. And that's something that our regional district representatives, uh, councillors Fletcher and Matt, could uh, certainly bring back to us at budget time. I know they'll be going through budget. So, you know, if we don't make a decision here, or if we do, it doesn't necessarily fetter the discretion of the regional board to make its own decision and bring it back for budget. Um, I just don't know that we can refer it back to that consideration. Regional district under the Regional Recreation and Culture. Yes. Aspects? Okay. Similar to what the city of Portland is done, essentially. Is there a second for that? No, well, sir. Okay, and just to be clear, what the city of Courtney said, it said it's not supported this time in the provision of an annual operating ground of 50,000 from the existing recreation service for Venice and that the city recommends a funding request be referred to the CDRD Regional Recreational and Cultural Facilities Funding Initiative for a review and determination as to the facility significance of the regional facility. Is that, is that what you'd like to say? That sounds very good. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we thought it. <laughs> ditto. Okay, so that's been moved. Is there a second of that? Thank you. Talk to discussion. Um, so, for clarification, they're, they're talking about referring it back to the um, recreation facilities review um, study that was yes. done by uh, Jennifer Wilson, I believe, yes. and that okay, so it'll go, it'll kind of get that. Although that study's been done, it'll kind of get thrown in on it for discussion at the RD. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the proposal. I think that the people that made the proposal. They, the, the legacy from the Olympics is is, 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 um, is neat to see, but I, I I was pleased and impressed that you're going beyond just training athletes, uh, elite athletes, which in itself is a noble goal. It's a legacy from the Olympics, and um, having a, a pushing on forward to education opportunities for youth in the community, and uh, uh, you know that's impre that impressed me, and I, I want to commend you for that. <coughs> but I think the, the discussion of the Performance for our regional district, and I listen to some of your arguments that Mount Washington taxpayers um, pay taxes to uh, to recreation facilities and don't get much bang for their buck, and um, uh, you know, that needs to be discussed there. And I, I guess there would be people in other outlying areas that might say the same thing um, when there are recreational facilities available to, to everyone, and maybe a distance away. 
I think the concept we would like to support from wondering, wondering how, whether financial falls in these times within our mandate and uh, within our jurisdiction. Yeah, well, it'll essentially go to the back of the regional district and ultimately form part of the budget discussion. Okay. So I, uh, I think we've heard the presentation, we have some background now, and we'll see what our regional district representative says. All right, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's good. All right, so um, we now are at correspondence, currently on page 147. We're from uh, Brenda Chappelle regarding tree talking and Tai Bay Road. We'll proceed. Yeah. We'll proceed then. Uh, I'll just mention I believe that the wing commander will be presenting at the Committee of the Whole of the Regional District on the 24th. So I presented at Willary the other day and I encourage him to come to the Regional District because that's where most of the issue was. What was the favor? I guess oh, sorry. Uh, you know, just you know, one quick comment. It would be great to see this resolved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the arguments are uh, very strong. I mean, the trees have been there for a very long time. They probably haven't grown significantly in a very long time. The maturity, like we do, stay there. And um, so, um, I, you know, I would like to see that we can do our utmost to to keep them there. I mean, you know, this speaks to the largest heron rookery on Vancouver Island. Yeah, I know that just briefly here, in terms of we see not much more to say, but uh, the Wing Commander explained to us that they've done some work in conjunction with the Wildlife uh, Service Branch, and they are working in what they call a 300 to 200 meter uh, buffer zone. They've done that, all they can do now, and they can't do any more now to the fall. And next year, assuming there's been no disturbance, then they can work within the 200, uh, sorry, 100 to 200 meter circle, and then ultimately down to the small levels. And they are working with the best practices in terms of the environment. So I'm sure you'll learn more in the regional district, and certainly if anyone's interested to attend, they can observe that presentation at the 4 o'clock next Tuesday. So, yeah, unreceived then, all those in favor? Motion's good. Uh, we heard from the citizens on patrol, um, thanking us for our previous grant aid request from Sandy Bank Capital, and we'll be discussing that at budget, of course. We'll proceed. Thank you. All those in favor? Motion's good. Uh, ben Davies uh, from Davies Financial Planning, revitalizing the downtown core. I would move proceed. I think he wants six more parking spaces. No, yeah, <laughs> and this did actually appear at the BIA, so he's going to send it off to them. They've already done it. Okay. All those in favor of the seat? Motion is good. A uh, letter from the Motorcycle Ride for Dad event uh, June 9th this year for receipts. Move the seat, and is he looking for us to grant some approval there? No. Uh, Just a call. Yeah, I'm looking for me to ride. Yeah. Or the acting mayor. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be the center then. That's a big challenge. That's right. On my way. All those in favor of receiving that? Yep. Just going to comment that I, I did participate in the last year. It's an excellent event. They do a great job. So. All right. I'll try to fit your leather jacket after. Yes. A <laughs> uh, letter from the Harbor Authority for the receipts. Need receipt. Second. Seconded. Seconded. And uh, all those in favor? And yes, uh, the staff did an amazing job that night. It was literally dark and stormy nights. Yeah. And last piece of correspondence is from Alan Hughes, Canadian Auto Workers Union. Uh, Move receipt. Second. Second. And just so you know, I did invite him to consider making a delegation, uh, carrying a delegation. And he was to get back to me, he has to get back. Have you heard? I did speak to him, he's actually out of town right now. Okay. So I just let it go. Okay, so it will happen at some point perhaps. Or? Okay. I, I think that would be good, then we can consider the request for a resolution so that it's appropriate time. Yeah, we'll wait to hear from him, but we certainly need to extend that invitation. Any further? All those in favor? Reports from members of council, Eric with Council Press. 
Um, I attended the memorial for the Baron Lux's head, who was a citizen of Lomax for a long time and um, very committed to social and environmental and um, great women. Um, I also attended the AYCC executive meeting. I'm um, on the executive at the moment. So I encourage everyone to go to the AVICC coming up in April to the Hewlett. And, um, and I'll be going to the Environmental Council after this meeting as my first time as the Pan Commons representative. Great. Thank you. And the dates for the AVICC are? I knew you'd say that. And it's the end of April. <laughs> I can 13. give you a more exact. 13 to 15? 15? Yeah. That sounds yeah. Right after the weekend okay. after Easter. Thank you. Um, I attended uh, just prior to Christmas. I attended my first meeting as a town rep with the Felder uh, group, and uh, that was a great meeting. And a social afterwards, which was fun. Uh, and uh, following it up with uh, the next meeting, which is this Thursday. Uh, I also attended the regional district's presentation. I think my news and. Um, I really enjoyed what he had to say and thought it was a good introduction for a new person. And uh, I'll be attending the uh, conference in Parksville next week. So. Great. Last question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we haven't met since early in December, so um, I would recap some of the Christmas events. Uh, attended the Base Commander's Open House, um, on the Craig's uh, in reception, um, the CBRD, we had our orientation. Elena and our orientation followed that as well. Um, early in January, um, Councillor uh, Swift joined us with the Nautical Days um, review, so we had a discussion on that. Um, and I, um, I also attended a full day at um, down in the Big House with um, St. Joe's Board. Uh, they are um, engaging with Aboriginal awareness and understanding, so it was a very, very powerful and engaging day there. Um, of course, a strategic planning meeting with uh, Greg Olenek, and look forward to that this weekend. Um, and this week, this week we had our first uh, CDRD waste management meeting and a uh, very thorough orientation with that, the inaugural regional hospital board meeting. And uh, I'm sure you've seen that um, the chair is Claire Mogla from Campbell River, and the vice chair is Bruce Harper's Jolla from Gary Bay. The hospital board, and uh, yesterday we had uh, an all-day strategic planning session at the CBRD. So we are uh, well, well aligned and ready to get down to work. Councilor Kim. Yes, quickly uh, attended with a number of you the joint council meeting of Comox First Nations. Uh, I went in December to the RCMP uh, Appreciation Social. Um, the, uh, um, I was very pleased to go as a second year with Councillor Grant, uh, Grant to the BIA meeting and, uh, and the letter from uh, Ben Davies, uh, uh, very impressed with the group there that are looking to think outside the box and looking at a vision for downtown revitalization. Um, and uh, it, it's Ben Davies' letter summed it up that here's a local person that's not sure he should invest in, in town and we need the help uh, to, to, to create opportunities there. Uh, attended the first Community Justice Committee meeting back in December. There's a new one coming up in January, and we'll be attending the Regional Library meeting in the Nanaimo upcoming in the next, upcoming in the next couple of weeks. And it works out well because I'm coaching basketball down there too, so I'm going to go from basketball to the library and back to basketball. <laughs> <laughs> it works out. No yelling at the library. Councilor Tom Grant. Well, I soon <laughs> learned why I'm on the Regional Board. It's Three times the work and twice the pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I attended. I, uh, I attended the, uh, the strategic planning meeting with Brenda Olnick. I found her to be. Uh, uh, I found her to be terrific, and I was even more surprised and more impressed when I found out she was local. So mm -hmm. I was really happy about that. That we're not hiring some blue suit from Vancouver to do this work. <laughs> I, attended, I attended the uh, that uh, meeting with counseling in Comox First Nations. 
I attended the uh, first meeting of the Comox Valley Housing Task Force. I attended the first Comox Strathcona Waste Management meeting, the Comox Strathcona Hospital Board, the Regional District Orientation, and a full day of strategic planning at the Regional District. So, it's been busy. That's okay. And amongst many of those things, strategic planning and other things, um, the main one was the BIA meeting that um, Councillor McKinnon came along. And um, one of the things that they're really looking to do as they look through their strategic plan is they're looking at some other marketing ideas, some new branding ideas, but also to uh, create more partnerships with things like nautical days. So they really want the door to be open to making that work for everybody rather than sort of a bit of an us versus them or whatever it could be. And also other people that use the park, like the originals only arts and things like that, they want to try and, if they're going to run events, try and run them in conjunction with things that are going on at the park. They see the park and Philbert Park as pretty integral parts of how we can get downtown uh, revitalized and working again and using the resources that we have. So, so I thought that was an important step to, to come out of that meeting. And uh, also, I attended an events meeting with them too, so we continue to look at new ways to bring people downtown. So that's my report. Hey, great. Yep, it's been a while since we met. Uh, I'll touch on a couple things before Christmas. I uh, had a meeting with Ed Moyes, who was here earlier. He was involved with the marketing arm of the BIA. And their committee is uh, underway, and uh, lots of great ideas around that. Also, a meeting with the President T. Otter around their strategic planning process, which will involve us in the very near future. Uh, I had a lunch meeting with our MLA just to touch base on a few issues uh, that we've talked about here at Council. I uh, staffed the Salvation Army Kettle before Christmas at QF, and uh, in spite of me wearing my uh, special Santa hat with the Habs logo on it, uh, I raised a lot of money. So I think they were just feeling sorry for me. So they threw lots of money in the kettle, which was great to see at that time of year. Uh, council to Council meeting, as mentioned, with KFN, a meeting with our CEO and John Watson and our planner around some of the issues around economic development in town. We had to take a start of that process with the BIA. And the mayors and the chair of the regional district had a meeting again with the MLA and McRae and talked a bit about the rec grants that we've all made application for and some of the issues around BC housing funding and what the Council of Tom's been involved with. And uh, then a meeting right after that with Rob Moore of the school district and representatives from North On College and Immigrant Services around the International Student Program Welcoming Ceremony. That will be held in September of this year. We did that last September as well. Over 350 international students between the college and the school district are here studying and put an economic opportunity for the Valley and MXC that as well have some role to play in that as well. I uh, attended, after my interview with uh, Ms. Olnick, uh, the inaugural meeting of the North Island Sunshine Coast Regional Advisory Committee of the Island Coast Economic Trust. Uh, long story short, I got appointed vice chair, and I'll just note that the Island Coast Economic Trust, out of the $50 million that was initially assigned a few years ago, uh, there is roughly $3.4 million left unassigned. There is currently a $400,000 cap on a funding application, and there's also a special uh, cap for any downtown vitalization project in terms of infrastructure of 250000 So it may provide us with some opportunities to still apply and there is uh, still applications that can be made on an ongoing basis. And there is hope over time that that will be topped up again by the province. It's resulted in laboring share of at least five to one. So $50 million or so 46 and change that's been allocated has been leveraged to the tune of over 240 million for various projects up and down the down and on the subject goes. And then today, earlier, I had the pleasure of uh, speaking to a leadership class at Highland School and around some of the youth issues, talking about what local government does, and there seems to be some keen interest in uh, playing a role at youth advisory. I know today I signed a letter to uh, Highland School asking for a representative to our advisory planning commission, so I'm sure we'll talk about that more as we go into our own strategic planning. So that is my report. Um, there are no other items for business and media questions at this time. Yes, here. Any members of the public have any questions at this time? Other than that, so we have no motion to adjourn. Thank you. Sure. Those in favor? <laughs> motion is carried. Yes. 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 Yes.